So uh, this is one of those things. It's like, okay, what do you, what do you preach? Uh, who's my audience? W- what do we need to learn from the scriptures tonight? And I pray that you can learn from the scriptures tonight, that you can forget how I look. I know it can be distracting. Uh, every time I look at a picture of, of me and my wife next to each other, it's like, who, like what, who is that ogre? What happened? Like God blinded Rachel for like three years so that she would say yes to marry me. So uh, forget how I look. If you have an attitude with me, just call me after. Just forgive me now. And then just call me afterwards and we'll talk. I love you. Um, And focus in on the scriptures. So the title of the lesson is the great prophets. The great prophets. God expects every single one of us to be a prophet or a prophetess. He expects us not to tell the future, but to speak the truth. You know, I had a revelation being here in Tampa over the last seven, eight months. Every church preaches the Bible. Every Well, let's just say the vast majority of churches on a Sunday morning will open the Bible. They'll present a message. They'll preach a message. What got Jesus killed and what gets us in trouble as disciples of Jesus is that we preach the truth about the Bible. We don't just present the Bible, we apply the Bible and expect unquestioning obedience to the scriptures. What does he say to the Pharisees? He says, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God, even though the Pharisees could quote verbatim whole books of the Bible. They would write out every word of the Bible and they could quote it verbatim left and right. He says, you don't know the scriptures, even though you can quote things. Therefore, you don't know the power of God. It's one thing to know God. It's another thing to be known by God. You know, in Matthew 7, the people come up as they're knocking on the door, trying to get into heaven. And Jesus says, like, hey, I never knew you. And they said, what, what, what do you mean? We, we, we drove out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. We knew you. He said, you knew me, but I didn't know you. And, and for me, it's like, man. It's one thing to preach the word. It's another thing to preach the truth about the word and how it applies to my life and how it applies to your life. The word of God is inescapable. The word of God is awesome. The Bible says that God has exalted his word above all his name. The Bible is the truth. It can, it can essentially be perceived as kind of like, like kind of cold and calculating. It has no emotion. It doesn't change because you kind of like are having a bad day. The Bible is the same all the time. Amen. Consider this. Uh, raise your hand if you're emotional. <laughs> right. Okay. So what if God has an emotional day? Aren't we created in his image? He's not necessarily talking about our physical features. Like what if God is having a bad day on judgment day? He sees you. He's like, you know what? I just can't do it, man. Like I'm just not, I'm just not with it today. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I don't want to answer your call. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. God's not going to do that. God's not a bouncer at a club either. Like you can't like uh, get get a favor from God where he kind of like lets you skip the line. You're judged by the word. The word doesn't change. The word cuts. The word divides. It's like a sword coming out of Jesus's mouth. It's like a hammer that breaks you to pieces. But God giving us the word and allowing us to be judged by the word was the kindest thing that God ever did for us. He says here, it never changes. Everything you need to know is right here within its covers. So the great prophets, he expects us to preach the truth. He expects us to preach his word. You know, of course, the great prophet is an allusion to the prophet Elijah. It's really interesting because in 1 Kings 17, Elijah just kind of shows up out of nowhere. We don't know who his parents are. We just know he's a Tishbite. It's, it's even thought by some that he wasn't an Israelite, but a Gentile chosen, to God, chosen by God to prophesy to the Israelites because the Israelites had drifted so far. Ahab had just become king of Israel in Samaria, and it says he was the most wicked king that had ever ruled. But consider in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 to 12. Turn there with me, if you will. This is talking about both Moses and Elijah. Of course, Moses represents the law. Elijah representing the prophets. Jesus is the culmination of both of those. Revelation 11, verse 1. It says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. 
but exclude the other court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. You see, you, you better have some reverence and respect towards the prophet in your church, towards the man of God. It says, if you want to harm the prophet, fire is going to come from their mouth, and that is how you must die. You see, your issue is not with the prophet. Your issue is with the Lord. Amen. It says, these men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. It says that Elijah and Moses tormented the people by preaching the word. The people could not escape the truth of God. And they were relentless in their preaching. They were relentless in the call, the unwavering call to obedience to the scriptures. It says they were killed by the beast and their bodies lay open. And the people of the world gloated. They said, finally, you see, now it's over. We don't have to listen to these people anymore. But <laughs> check out what happens. It says in verse 11, but after the three and a half days of a uh, breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. You know, it says that they were killed just like the Lord. And then, in essence, Elijah and Moses, in one way, were resurrected when Jesus was resurrected Jesus being the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. So when Jesus died, Satan thought he had the victory. But Jesus went into hell, kicked in the doors, preached to the demons. Without it, like there wasn't like a message, like you're going to get some hope from this message, amen? You'd be like, man, I can change. God is awesome. Jesus just went and said, hey guys, there's no hope for you. I just thought I'd give you one last final kind of message of condemnation before I go and reign for eternity in heaven. <laughs> Jesus raised from the dead. That is the power that lives in you and me to overcome the world, to overcome our sinful nature, to overcome anything that would ever distract us from God. You know, it says in James 5 that Elijah was a person just like us, but that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain on the earth for three years. You know, your prayers can change any situation. Your prayers can change any person. Your prayers can even change weather systems. Your prayers are powerful if you're righteous, if you stand up for the Lord and take a stand for the truth. Go to 1 Kings chapter 17, the great prophets. Point number one, the price of being a prophet. You know, here... We find the story that James 5 talks about. And it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. You see the power of the word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. And I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. So this is Elijah announces a, a, a drought. And he also says, hey, listen, I serve God. And here's the reality. There's going to be a drought. I actually prayed for the drought. So, yes, I am responsible for the calamity that you're now experiencing. But prayer can change anything. 
God tells him, hey, listen, the drought is going to affect you also. So the plan is that you're going to go and live and camp down by this little brook, this little tiny kind of stream, this little river of water, and you'll be fed by ravens. Now, a raven is just an overgrown crow. Are you with me? And you got to, you got yeah. both ravens and crows were considered unclean by the Jews. So when you think about it, God is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to send an unclean bird to provide for your needs. He had everything that he needed, probably not everything that he wanted. I don't know what kind of bread it was that the ravens were bringing, maybe some crumbs that they had scooped up just through their travels. Uh, ravens and crows are both carrion feeders, meaning they, on the side of the road, will feed on the uh, corpses of other animals. So I don't really know what kind of uh, uh, meat Elijah was feasting on right there. But God says, listen, I'll take care of you. God decides the way that you get the help that you get. You and I can't decide that. You know, maybe you'll look at the person that uh, your church leader has discipling you, and you think this dude is just an overgrown crow. This dude is an unclean bird. Uh, are you sure you picked the right one? I think I should be, you know, at the end of the day, we're all kind of a mess in the flesh. I think I should be discipled by a prettier bird, by somebody that's better than me. And somebody that's better than this bozo discipling me. <laughs> and God's like, uh-uh. You get help the way that I determine it. You get help the way that I think that you need to be helped. You know, if I get a call from Matt and he says, to <laughs> he says, hey, bro, uh, exciting news. Ralph is now the leader of the Tampa Bay International Christian Church. Okay. Amen, bro. Uh, is he going to disciple me? He's going to disciple. Well, he'll decide if he wants to disciple. You may not want to. Maybe he'll be, you know, you just be the kids' kingdom coordinator. Amen. That's awesome. They say, hey, Ralph, I'm going to be the best shepherd you've ever had in your life. People do not follow titles. They follow leaders. You know, and sometimes you can get a little bit caught up and trying to achieve a certain status and get a certain title that you think is somehow going to empower you. You see, Elijah was from outside of the established order, yet he spoke the word of God and changed the weather. But he had to be humble himself, God determining the way he would be helped. You know, verse 7, it says, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the, the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath. Of Sidon and stay there. I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. This is even more interesting. He goes from kind of like a, a bird, which is weird enough, but then he says, Go to this Gentile widow who will provide for you. You know, God is, is he wants to raise up leaders, he wants to raise people up to contribute to his kingdom and to forcefully advance it, and he'll he'll raise people up from unlikely sources. You know, Elijah's called to now go and raise up this widow in the middle of the drought. It says, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. You know, it's incredible because this widow is supposed to supply Elijah with food. This is the promise from God. So he shows up and he says, hey, you know, can you bring me some water? She says, okay. So while she's getting the water, he says, oh, and some bread too. She says, you know what? I don't have any bread. I have this little bit of flour. I'm about to go make my final meal, my last supper. And me and my son are going to eat it. And then we're going to die because we have nothing left. This was a real famine. People were emaciated, starving to death. Three years with no rain. I mean, we, we're a little bit removed from that. Most of us didn't grow up on a farm. Maybe Joe Mack did. Amen. But you, you see, like, uh, it's like, if it doesn't rain, there's no food. The animals die. You can't go hunt. The crops die. You can't grow anything. You die. And he says, well, feed me some food. 
You know, it's so funny with the COVID-19, they're talking about a potential meat shortage. You know, God forbid we all have to start eating some more vegetables. You know what I mean? And it's really interesting because Elijah was a man, a person just like us. He had temptations just like us. And, you know, I don't know about you, but as a man, if I showed up and I'm, I'm with a widow who's about to go and die, a widow who has a son, and she says, I don't have anything. I'm like, I can't, I can't ask her for, I can't ask her for anything. I mean, she's a widow. I'm a man. The birds can feed me. Why would I ask anything of this widow? But you see, God had a plan to use her sacrifice. God had a plan in all of it, even though Elijah probably didn't fully understand what was going on. You know, you can't ever get in between God's people and God. And sometimes as a leader, as a campus disciple, it's tempting to try to mitigate the direction. Matt gives some direction. You can kind of want to change it a little bit, make it a little bit more palatable. And God says, listen, I sent you to the widow. She will provide for you. You know, if you recall in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, the ark kind of stumbles. The ox stumbles and the ark shakes. You guys remember that? And it's Uzzah that puts his hand to the, to the ark to try to, you know, he thought he was doing something good to try to stabilize the ark. The mistake he made is that we don't stabilize the ark. The ark stabilizes us. God has a plan for everything in your life. And sometimes when you're called to an extreme sacrifice, wrapped in that sacrifice is your salvation. Within that extreme radical commitment is your salvation. You know, to get the thing you want most, you got to go to the place you least want to go. Being in the middle of missions, we know we can go get the money. You're just going to have to go and ask people for it. You might have to talk to your neighbors. You might have to talk to your uncle. You might have to talk to your cousin. And it's always a little uncomfortable asking people for money, you know, and you call them up and you're just like, hey, uh, hey, I got this thing going on. You put together a video. Maybe it's not quite as awesome as Austin's, you know. Uh, you, you didn't quite get the memo right there. Maybe you got your phone in like vertical instead of horizontal. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. got awkward. All righty. But what happens is that God will use you no matter what. He expects you to go out and to obey. And the line between worldliness and wisdom can oftentimes be quite blurry and quite fine. And I find that, you know, as campus disciples, you're radical, you're fired up, you sold out. You get a little older, you get married, you get some kids going on. And you're like, is that wise? <laughs> is that... You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to go out and beg. Oh, so you're better than Jesus? Did you have a better idea? You don't want to go out and, oh, so you're better than the Israelites? Then God sent and told them, hey, ask your neighbors. I'll make them favorably disposed to you. Well, let's see what happens in verse 13. It says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Amen. That's an encouraging command for all of us. Can I get a, a, a fist pump right there? Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Amen. Fire it up. Go home. Do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me, what you have from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. That's incredible. He says, first bring me some food, then go and prepare something for yourself. We've got to expect great sacrifice from ourselves. We've got to expect great sacrifice from the people we disciple. We've got to expect great sacrifice from even the people studying the Bible. It's a disservice to the people that God has placed in your life to not call them to the standard and to not call them to great sacrifice. He says, if you do this, You'll always have flour, and the oil will not run dry as long as the drought lasts. So what do we learn? If she goes through with it and does make this sacrifice, this is actually her salvation. Well, what happens? Verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up 
in the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So because Elijah had the courage and the conviction to call this, this woman who was weak to a radical sacrifice, and because she had the faith to see that God was going to provide for her, not only did she survive, but her young son survived and her whole family had enough food to eat. We can't get in the way of what God is expecting from his people. We don't preach our version of the gospel. We don't preach a watered down version of the gospel. We preach the version of the gospel that got Jesus killed on the cross. Why? Because we expect obedience. You know, Jesus was persecuted. The apostles were persecuted. What do you think is going to happen to us? Sometimes you feel like the stairs too high and you want to try to lower it. I felt that last week. I was doing some Bible studies and I really was like, I just want to just like, just lower it just a little bit. Can you make it there? Like, can you, can you, can you clear the bar? If I, maybe just like a couple centimeters lower. Can you, do you want to be a disciple, please? You ever feel that temptation? Like, would you please join our church? You know, like seeking God is not the first part of a series of negotiations where we talk about what you can keep and what you need to get rid of for God. The Bible says you've got to give up everything. you got to call others to the standard. That's how we raise up leaders, by calling people to the standard. And it's obvious that God is doing that in the Sages World sector. Amen? Verse 14, you'll have all you need. You know, Matthew 6 says, if you seek the kingdom first, you'll have everything you need, not everything you want. Everything you need. Seek the kingdom in such a way that it, it, it shows the world that this is all that there is. That it's not merely a prioritizing. But Luke says simply to seek the kingdom, implying that that's all that matters and that that's all that there is. God can actually inconvenience your life. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like, man, this is inconvenient. You know, people come to God and true. True, he comforts the disturbed, but he disturbs the comfortable. And God, when he imposes his will in your life, you're going to have to change some things. You're going to have to move some places. In the last 13 years, I've moved 17 times. Are you with me? It, it wasn't until the last move that I just made from California to Tampa. I thought, I thought, oh, yeah, I got it down pat. I know how to move. And it rocked my world. I hit the three-month wall. And I thought, yeah, I got this. Cool, we're good. Uh -uh. God will inconvenience your life. It's not about convenience or comfort. It's about doing God's will. You know, it's interesting here. It goes on, and it says in verse 17 that sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched herself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. You know, as a leader, which all of you are, you might not be the most popular person in the, in the room. <laughs> And if people can feel when you preach the word that you're reminding them of their sin, I'll never forget I was preaching and this, uh, this young sister came up to me and she said, I feel like you're, you make me feel guilty about my sin. I don't like it. I said, I, I can't make you feel anything, number one. And uh, guilt is a state. You, if you are guilty, you're guilty or innocent. It's not a feeling. Uh, but what preaching does is it exposes your guilt, which you feel shame about. So you feel ashamed because you are guilty. So I'm not making you feel guilty. You feel ashamed because you are guilty, right? Some people say, hey, when you preach the word, it will expose people's hearts. And this lady says, hey, like, why did you, why did you do this? Like, why did you even come here? And Elijah's like, man, you know, when you preach the word, there's some consequences. I God, I pray, please let this lady make it. Please let her have the faith. You ever feel when you're praying for somebody, you said, please let them have the faith to make it, to see it. 
to decide to do it. You're just like Elijah. And even after a miracle happens, I mean, it wasn't too long before this that she sees this incredible miracle and she still hates him. You know, it's like people can hate you after the miracle. You can baptize somebody and turn around like, kind of like, ah, oh, you inconvenienced my life. Like, really? Salvation? Are you with me? This is what it's like. But that's okay. Good discipling, which this lady gets, and then she says, wow, okay, I see that you are the man of God. You know, you do speak the truth from God. Amen. It's just that, that extra little detail. Good discipling is like poking a bear. You just know when you say, you know, there's no such thing as not knowing how to disciple somebody. And there's no easy way to do it. You just got to jump in and swim. Amen. It's just, it don't assume anything. That's the cardinal sin of discipling. You just got to get in there and say the stuff that you know you need to say that you probably don't want to say. And you know, as soon as you push the button, you're going to hit a nerve and you poke the bear and they might respond badly. That's actually the best way to get somebody's heart to open up to the scriptures. I'm grateful for my wife. You know, she's a very courageous woman. Sometimes uh, she pokes the bear. Amen. The bear being me. <laughs> and I'll never forget living in Chile and feeling uh, kind of the, really the truly the first pains of training in the ministry. And I was made to feel, I believe it was by God, that everything was my responsibility. I remember showing up. I'd been there uh, a couple of months. I didn't speak any Spanish. And there, I took over a ministry, and it had been a week. And there were two followers. And I was at staff. And I was asked, Carlos Mejia was the lead evangelist. He says, Bro, what happened with these followers? I'm like, I don't know, bro. He says, bro, it's your responsibility. I'm like, what? I've been doing it. For, I've only had this ministry for a week. He says, whose name is at the top of the paper? My name. He said, it's your responsibility. And that's good discipling. Good discipling is calling people to the summit, no matter how far the summit looks. I remember living in Chile. We went on a hike in the, in the Andes Mountains, the Andes. And we were with this, this Chilean guy who was like a gazelle on the heights. Like he had this, these long, this long, like these long flowing locks. And uh, he was like, literally like, kind of like those deers that the sis Jessica was talking about. He was just like prancing from like boulder to boulder. And I was like, what the heck? I'm like dying. And we went up five hours. Okay. And every time we stopped, we're like, bro, like, how far is this? Somebody's like, it's right over there. Just keep going. And the more we went, the further it got. And it was four hours. And I'm like, bro, it's further now than it was two hours ago. What the heck is going on? Is it the lack of oxygen? Is it the altitude? And that's, that's perseverance as the disciple, as the Christian. You're following your leader. You're crazy evangelist. You're crazy disciple. You're like, bro, you're crazy woman's missionary. Sis, where's, how long are we, what is, is there an end? Yeah, it's just right over yonder. Just keep going. We went up for five hours. We went down, it took us four hours. Going down was worse than going up. I'll explain later. One of the sisters actually, uh, because of it, lost her big toenail. So it's kind of gnarly. Amen. But that's what it, that's, that's good discipling in Acts 5. The Pharisees hate the apostles. And what they say is that these men are determined to make us responsible for this man's blood. That's exactly what we're doing. We're determined to make people, to expose the fact that they are responsible. That's my goal tonight, to help you to remember that you are responsible for the shed blood of Jesus. Not so that you can feel bad, but so that you can be reminded of how good the gospel is. How awesome your life is that you didn't get the wages of sin, not what you truly deserve, but instead opted for the gift of God. He said, man, whatever I got to do to knock out missions, I'm going to do it. Where there's a will, there's a way. Whatever I got to do to be personally fruitful, I'm going to do it. Whatever position I need to fill in the kingdom to advance things forward, I will do it. You know, when I lived in New York City, I always wore every Sunday the same suit the same shirt, the same tie, the same shoes, and the same socks. And it was ugly, too. It was this terrible-looking beige suit. It didn't quite fit. The shirt was yellow, like a mustard. This tie was, like, straight out of 1993. And But I had to, I was like, I can't, and I didn't know about dry cleaners. You know, I was like, 20, I was like 22, 23, you know. Uh, I was like, I have to wear it. I'm going to miss an opportunity. 
And sometimes it was, you know, put the chairs up. Sometimes I was a missionary in New York for three years. And for one year out of those three years, I served in Kids Kingdom. Surprise, surprise, my co-leader was Rachel every time. You see, when you have a servant's heart, you get a wife or a husband. I'm looking at you. Yes, you. Straight at you. And God did awesome things. But it's that heart. It's, it's humbling. Leviticus 10, it's really interesting. It's this incredible celebration where the, uh, the, essentially the priesthood has now been officially established. And two of Aaron's sons go up and offer what the Bible says is unauthorized fire. They just stepped a little bit out of bounds. They're just like, yeah, it was a little presumptuous. Ah, you shouldn't have done that. Like, yeah, it was like your heart drifted just like a little bit too far. You were on the line and then you just like one step too far. And it says that fire came out from God and consumed them. And what's really incredible, you know, turn over there real quick. Hold your finger in 1 Kings 17. This will save you. I'm just, I'm just giving you some weapons. Amen, guys. Leviticus chapter 10. Just check this out real quick. It says Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they were the ones that died. And then it says in verse 3, Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. You know what's incredible? His sons die. There's nothing worse in life than when, you're, than when your children die before you. And then his younger brother, Moses, comes up and basically says, hey, I told you so. That's on you. It's like, oh, snap. What did Aaron do? Surely he's like, you little twerp. You little prince of Egypt. I'm going to sort you out. Don't you realize my son has just died? How dare you come disciple me? I'm feeling emotional. Don't you understand my problems? Don't you understand my situation? Look at what Aaron says. It says Aaron remained silent. He didn't say anything. He just like, he's like, he just took it. <laughs> That's responsibility. That's leadership. Learning how to take pressure. Learning how to take the responsibility for things that really... You're responsible, if your name is on the top of the paper, for things that happen even when you're not present. Aaron understood this. Then he tells Aaron, don't let your hair become unkempt. Stay at the altar, you and your other two sons. Go and fulfill what I'm telling you to fulfill. And it says they did that, and Aaron came back and reported to Moses, and then Moses was satisfied. This right on the heels of his two sons being killed. You see, he was made responsible for what was happening. That's the price of being a prophet. You know, preaching is awesome. I know you want to preach. I know you want to do the sermon, the, the lesson for Devo next Thursday. Amen. I know you can't wait. You're just like, you're, you're itching. You're, you're thirsting. But there's a price. It's responsibility. You know, what does that mean? When things go good, it's because of God. When things go bad, it's because of us. That's really what it boils down to. Point number two, the plan of the prophet. So you got the price of being a prophet. Then you got the plan of the prophet. Look at 2 Kings chapter 4. We're almost done. So we know Elijah. Now we got Elisha. And it says here in 2 Kings chapter 4, it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. She says, you know, she says, Hey, my husband was in the full-time ministry, and he's dead, and he has a lot of debt. So apparently ministers didn't get paid too much back then either, amen? It's just like, hey, it is what it is, you know? The full-time ministry, weighing it in for the money. It's a passion. And she's saying, get my credit. They're coming. They're going to take my sons? And Elisha said, well, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing here at all. Can you ever, can you relate? You know, maybe he sold it on permission. He's like, I got nothing. I sleep on the floor. I got an air mattress. It's flat by 2, 2 a.m. Do you want that? She says, listen, I don't have anything except a little bit of oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. You know, she didn't have anything except a little bit of oil. What's the point? You have everything you need 
for an incredible miracle, for an incredible miracle. He says, he says, listen, go ask all your neighbors for jars. Don't ask just a few. And I really love what Marcel challenged us with tonight. He says, hey, if you, if you literally could convince whatever, fill in the blank, a thousand people to give you a dollar. Do you realize homeless people do this every day? Do you understand that? I'm not promoting that you, that you become homeless, amen? But rather that you produce some platform that allows you to ask as many people as possible. Now, you might get rejected by 999, but that thousand person might give you a thousand bucks. Come up, as Marcel is typing right now, with a radical plan. There's a big difference, a Grand Canyon difference between I can't. Let me rephrase that. When you say I can't, really you're saying I won't. When you say, I don't know if I can, but I will, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. Now you're saying, let's open the door for God to do something radical. People are as open as your mouth is. You open your mouth, and this goes for Bible studies. It was awesome to hear Kahari share about how the men's studies in Gainesville have, have doubled. Why? People start talking, amen? You with me? I feel challenged by that. I'm convicted. I'm like, oh my gosh, we need to double. We need to triple our studies. People are open. They're more open now than ever. Don't ask for just a few Bible studies. Ask as many people as possible. Bury yourself in Bible studies. Create a problem in your ministry. Call up your leader like, I have too many studies. I double booked myself. I love it. If I have a disciple tell me I double booked myself, I'm like, yes, good, well, well done. This is a good problem. The call, the call is for everybody to be fruitful. We can be as fruitful as we want to be, and the time is now to be fruitful. You know, I'll never forget, uh, there was a time in L.A. We were uh, living in Riverside. We were, we were discipling uh, the, the lead couple in the East region, which is actually, um, yeah, it's, it's in L.A., amen? And there was a, a, a couple, a married couple that had been studying the Bible for months, and the woman, it turns out, had stage four cancer. Now, she knew, but she just wasn't quite ready while she was studying the Bible. But things actually started to get worse. And she, finding out that she was in pretty bad shape, that she was in pretty bad condition, made radical changes, studied the Bible, and became a true disciple. Now, her husband wasn't quite as gung-ho in the beginning but then was baptized also. He changed his heart, became a disciple, got baptized. I forget when, when uh, Sharon Wong passed away, we went to the funeral. It was probably the most powerful funeral I had ever been to. Kirk Hamula, Hamula who leads uh, now the East Region, did a, a masterful job. And it was so intense to realize that this woman, she was a true disciple. Uh, she put the spiritual family over her physical family, even in that condition, and, and really... Uh, in many ways, opened the door for her husband to become a faithful disciple also. And to know that our sister made it to heaven because of the perseverance of the disciples, because somebody shared their faith with Sharon. You know, Dennis, actually, before the uh, passing of his wife, I remember was having some challenges with special missions. Now, we knew that he was a successful businessman. We just didn't really know the details. And I remember I actually went and preached a lesson, and he, he had an attitude with me. Um, he felt like, oh, this is all about money. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that, you know, which it is what it is, you know. Uh, and we got in there. Kirk Hamlet got in there. The shepherds got in there, discipled his heart. His wife passes after that. He ends up, now the East Region had a pro projected a $20,000 shortfall, meaning they were going to come in $20,000 short in their missions. That's what they were projecting, meaning it could have been a lot worse than that. And I remember talking to Kirk, he said, bro, like, who knows? Who knows if, if this brother isn't just going to drop $20,000? Who knows? Anybody could. The silver and gold belong to God. And I remember after him being discipled, people getting in there, seeing his wife's passing as a faithful disciple. Come Mission Sunday, he gave $20,000 and literally covered to the dime their goal. Since then, he's become 
almost the sole contributor to our foundation in Cambodia, our orphanage there for mercy, and has also funded many of the projects uh, in Haiti and in other places around the world. Now he's an incredible disciple. I mean, this guy is the most loving, caring, gregarious brother you could ever hope to meet. And many of you remember in the uh, Good News email seeing uh, the McKean's there at, with Dennis Wong at his pharmaceutical company, realizing the impact that he's made. But it was dicey there for a minute. I got to tell you, it was a little touch and go with his faith. But there were brothers in there that were willing to preach the word and call them to a radical standard. And now we're, we're seeing an incredible blossoming of his faith and all the people around the world that are impacted because of it. You know, Sharon passed away at, at 40 years old. She left three young children behind. But it's incredible because those three children are growing up in the kingdom. Every night I pray for my kids and I say at the end of the day, you know, we pray that they're safe, that they're kept from harm. But all I really care about is that they become disciples. At the end of the day, everything else is fine. Whatever needs to happen, I pray that they become disciples. Just so happens that after his wife passed away, his seven-year-old daughter was diagnosed with leukemia. He's become more faithful since then. He's become more active in sharing his faith since then because a few brothers had the courage and the conviction there in the East region to get in there and call them to the standard. I want to encourage you to get in there with your family. Get in there with your friends. I know we've got some high school friends visiting with us. Let the people that invited you to, dis to disciple you, to instruct you with the word, who knows what God wants to do with your life. He can change the world with just a handful of people that have faith. Point number three, the pressure of the prophet. Look at what it says in verse eight. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a woman, -do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. That's all the preacher needs. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you've gone all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. Well, what can be done for her, Elisha asked. Yehizi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. But the woman became pregnant and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The pressure of the prophet is to call people to have radical kingdom dreams. It's to call people to raise their hopes. I want to call all of us to raise our hopes, to have, to have a dangerous dream in the kingdom, to have a hope that causes you to feel maybe a little bit vulnerable. You know, a kingdom dream, I remember, you know, I ask people, hey, what's your kingdom dream? They say, man, to not fall away. It's like, okay, bro, that's, that's, that's more of like a decision. You see what I'm saying? I literally had somebody tell me that. What's your kingdom dream? Stay faithful this year. It's like, oh, Lord. I said, oh, what's your kingdom dream? To be a mercy ambassador. Bro, you already are. Congratulations. You know, a kingdom dream is something that kind of, it'll scare you to say. You know, you say it. it. Took me a couple of years. So, bro, what do you want to do? Like, bro, I want to be an evangelist. What? An evangelist. An evangelist. An evangelist. They say, oh, oh, you want to be an evangelist. When you say that out loud, all of a sudden people start they, they start looking at you. Oh, 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 you want to be an evangelist. Oh, well, maybe you should get out of bed at a reasonable time in the morning. Oh, bro, did you make your bed? I'm pretty sure evangelists make their bed. Oh, bro, are these your shoes? Are these evangelist shoes right here? Like, oh, what, what, what's this, bro? So you go, oh, man, if I say it out loud, they're going to start to expect something from me. It's a dangerous dream. But then it's really interesting when you're the prophet calling people to have dangerous dreams. That's the pressure of a prophet, knowing that, that hey, it's dangerous. It's a, it's a risky business. I take calculated risks every day, and so do you. But we never gamble. God is faithful. And, and she says, listen, man, don't get my hopes up. Don't mislead me. It might, might not work. And, and he says, well, no, you're going to have a son. It's going to happen. You know what? We're going to keep on raising up leaders and sending them out. <laughs> it goes on. And it says the child grew. And one day he went out to his father. 
who was with the reapers, my head, my head, he said to his father. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat in her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. The husband was just, this guy is a total, yeah, he's just a little slow, amen? It's just, it's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she sent out, set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask, are you all right? Is your husband okay? Is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? You know, the call for tonight, raise your hopes. Raise your hopes. Get, get out, get, let your dreaming get a little dangerous. Let your vision go beyond your talent. Amen. I got to be honest. Uh, you know, I just, if I had, Marcel's got more talent in his pinky finger than I have in my whole body, you know? Uh, it's just like, but, but, but I have high hopes. I have high hopes. One day I'm going to join that freestyle, you know, zoom video call right there. Me and Joe, we're going to hop in and do a kind of a, uh, what's that country rap song? The, you know what I'm talking about? The, yeah. That one. You say, okay, I got high hopes. You got to raise your hopes. You got to believe that God is going to do something. If your kingdom dream doesn't doesn't scare you a little bit. If you don't get a little bit like a, like you say, hey, what's your kingdom dream? Like, and you say it, people don't go like this. Oh, that's not a kingdom dream. Raise your hopes. Raise the bar. Raise the ceiling. Have something that will drive you. Without a vision, you will perish. There are times where, where my faith isn't great. My relationship with God isn't great sometimes. My, my life lags a little bit, but it's, it's the vision. It's the dream that drives us on. To say, even when I'm tanking, because sometimes you will, I'm going to keep going because I know what awaits me on the other side. Point number four, the power of the prophet. We'll close out here. It says in verse 29, Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, don't answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on it. You see, Elijah had a little bit of a moment. He tried to send his intern to do what only an evangelist can do. Amen. It's like, yeah, it's not going to work. So Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha. So the, the boy, you know, he's didn't convert him. Not awake. I don't know what happened. He used your staff. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. Then he got on the bed and stretched upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. The power of the prophet. You know, the servant had the staff of the prophet, but he didn't have the faith or the power of the prophet. You know, doing what it takes to convert people, doing what it takes to raise people from the dead, it can get a little uncomfortable. Consider that Elisha lays on top, on top of this corpse. Nose to nose, eyes to eyes, mouth to mouth. And he's laying on top of me, he's praying. He's like, oh God, I hope this works. You ever be in a Bible study? You're like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> uh, turn over to Psalm 23. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, and he's like, oh God, God, please. You ever pray in the middle of a study? You're like, please, Father God, please. <laughs> and then it says the body grows warm. You see when they start to get it? Like, oh, and he's pacing back and forth. He does it again, nose to nose. You think that was a little uncomfortable? I think so. Eyes to eyes, mouth to mouth. Awkward anyways. And then it says the boy, he starts to sneeze. He sneezes seven times. He's like this. 
<laughs> and then he wakes up. He's like, oh my gosh, he's alive. You see, when you're studying the Bible with people, it's not an issue of time. They don't need time. You need more faith. You need more power. And this is really important for the men. The men need to be powerful. They need to have great power. They need to act like men, like men, sisters. Men should act like men. They should not act like sisters. Amen. And sisters, they should act like sisters. You see what I'm saying? It's a good thing. It's a holy thing. It's a godly thing. It doesn't mean that sisters can't join the football game. You know what I'm saying? But, but the brothers are not joining the tea party. Let's just, let's just leave it right there. You see, they, we got to have the power of the prophet. You know, it's incredible to see Jordan baptized last Thursday. And uh, just to see faith, to see the faith. I really got to lift up Ralph. You know, Ralph, the beginning of the year, w- was fasting. He was fasting all the time. I'm like, this kid weighs a buck 15 soaking wet. If he keeps fasting, he's gonna, there's going to be some problems. And he's just I'm like, Ralph, how's it going? Oh, I've been fasting for seven days. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Fasting, just water. Fasting and praying, fasting and praying, fasting and praying. All of a sudden, he he says, and then I sit with him and I rebuke him one day on campus because he's like, I just don't know if I can be successful. I'm like, what what are you talking about? Like, you're you're a cranking brother. You're you're a son of God. Like, what what do you you bag that? And then the next Sunday, I believe it was like right after that, Chris comes to church. And this is after he had been pestered and pestered and bothered and bothered and shared and shared with by Ralph. He becomes a disciple. The Sunday Chris is baptized, Taiji is at church. We don't even know who Taiji is, where he came from. Uh, I didn't really know what to make of it. I see him. He's hard to miss, you know, 6'2", uh, good-looking guy. His hair was all kind of going out that day. And turns out Ralph had shared his faith with a co-worker who invited Taiji. The co-worker didn't come, but Taiji did. Taiji becomes a disciple. Once Taiji becomes a disciple, he reaches out to his two best friends from college, Jordan and Don. Jordan's studying the Bible on the light and darkness study. I say, hey, bro, drive to Tampa. It's 14 hours. Yes, it's crazy. Yes, it's radical. But that's what God is calling you to do. It's clear in the scriptures. It's awesome. He comes, finishes his studies, commits the movement to Tampa by Saturday, gets baptized, becomes your brother last Thursday. It's like, dude. And I'm just, I'm, I, I'm so in awe of God because only God can do that. Only God can produce that. But there's the power of the prophet present. There's the man of God. There's the, the Ralph, the Ralphs among us that show up, that then that power transfers to Chris, that transfers to Taiji to say, hey, you've got to come and you've got to check this out and study the Bible. God has called you and me to be a great prophet. But don't forget the price of being a prophet. Don't forget that the prophet has a plan, that there's great pressure being the prophet. But also, when you have the power of the prophet, you'll see incredible miracles in your ministry. You're going to nuke and blow out your missions. You know, as disciples, failure is not an option. Close that back door, cover it with cement. Don't ever walk through it. There is a worse fate than death. You know, I love, and I'll leave you with this, the Spartan charge, as they were sent off to battle, their mothers or their wives would tell them to come back with their shield or on it. And what that meant is that they would either be victorious in battle or that they would die trying. And that if they came back without their shield, it meant that they had run and retreated from the battle. And he says, listen, come back with your shield. And with Jesus, if we fight, We always come back with our shield. And I want to call all of us, blow out your missions. Shut the door. There is no failure. We don't fail. We don't say, I'll try. If you're trying, you're lying. Make it happen. Talk to Marcel. Talk to Austin. Talk to people who know what's up, who know what they're doing. Get the faith and make it happen. Amen, guys. I love you. You're amazing. You're awesome.